continue the um, continue the uh, uh, the discussion. Um, perhaps I'll I'll ask uh, uh, I'll ask one one one, one question, um, uh, which is uh, which is essentially the the issue of um, you know do we have an appropriate toolkit already and, and what are the gaps and perhaps um, uh, you can each uh, just add you know what what is your 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 summary of that um, I have a I'd like to uh, start with um, uh, Tariq uh, at the uh, Banque de France uh, more specifically about um, CRE um, tools. Uh, so your assessment came out uh, as saying essentially there wasn't much of a problem. So um, there was no need to introduce macroidential binding macroidential measures. Um, but then uh, my question is, you know, had that assessment uh, differed? Uh, what macroidential policy tools would you have uh, taken, would you even have had at your disposal? Uh, so perhaps you can start on that question and uh, yeah. others may. Sure. Come in. So uh, actually, if the, the outcome had been different, we had thought about what kind of uh, measures we could have used. So for banks, uh, we, we, we uh, looked at all the options that we had and to to make it a short story, so if you remember in, in my table, the 124 and 164 CRR uh, measures were in this case not appropriate because one of them was targeting standard uh, approach banks and most French banks are IRB banks. The, the, the next one with 164, what is, it's, it's, uh, it targets retail exposure and in this case it's obviously not the case. So for banks, and, and also the, the question was, what about borrower-based measures? But the problem is that, first of all, we had mm, quite uh, not very uh, uh, reliable data about LTVs, but the, the, one, the data that we had showed that they were, in most cases, quite uh, low LTVs, so it could have been either counterproductive to use LTVs. So we, we ended up for banks to say, if we have to do something, we'll probably do it through Article 458 CRR, which is uh, so we can we can uh, uh, we can uh, um, specify the risk weights that we would use for, for, for commercial real estate exposures. The problem with this with this uh, measure is that it's quite uh, a burdensome procedure, as it was shown by uh, by another speaker. So it will have taken a lot of time. But for banks, this is probably what we ha would have used. Uh, then for insurers and, and uh, funds, <laughs> the question was, uh, uh, so again, we have in the toolkits, we can use LTVs because they, are, they can be applied to all kind of lenders that are supervised, so also insurers and funds. But again, in this case, they, it would not have been really appropriate. So, Frankly, uh, the, the, the kind of measures that we would have probably used would be something more, at, at this stage, uh, micro-prudential, so how to, to, to limit concentration or to put some concentration limits, etc. By the way, when I said previously that, uh, that we have one uh, insurer that has uh, coverage of its SCR a little bit below 100%, uh, it, it turns out that this, uh, this uh, insurer is currently uh, there's a, an ongoing microprudential mission uh, on it, but uh, um, so it's not macro, but it's a microprudential uh, measures going on right now. Uh, and as regards the fund managers, again at this stage, it would probably have been uh, something about is this relevant to limit their leverage? But there's no dedicated at this stage macroprudential uh, tool. Uh, per se to do it. So it would have been probably, again, uh, we would have relied on the AMF, so the, 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 the market uh, authority to, to look, uh, look uh, at uh, micro measures. 
So for banks, to, to sum it up, for banks, probably Article 458, CRR, and for insurers and banks, probably rely at this stage uh, to, on, uh, on micro-measures. But in the end, it turned out that there, there was no, at least at the systemic risk level, uh, reason to do this. Seems I have to know it works. So yeah, I, I'm not really an expert on this matter, but, but what, what I can add is that that from from these cross-country comparisons that have been done on on an aggregate level, it really seems that it's uh, borrower characteristics that that affect the volatility of cycles. So it seems natural that that it should be instruments that are targeted towards borrowers that that should be more effective. Uh, this holds in particular as a, as there are lots of uh, idiosyncratic developments at sectoral regional levels, and I guess it's easier to target instruments uh, on the borrower side to, to, to tackle the, these developments. Okay, thanks. So, I mean, do we have a comprehensive good enough toolkit? So, at least in our case, no. But also, in a more general way, I think that, I mean, that during the last few years there has been a lot of a lot of good belief in macro brew that macro brew will be something which like uh, that with macro brew we can get rid of all our problems it's kind of kind of a silver bullet and of course it won't be like that but also it means that there won't be if because there won't there isn't one silver bullet a magical tool we need to have more tools and I somehow synthesize the idea that we need to have tools in all these three groups and, and, and as I mentioned at least in Finnish case we don't have those yet and then the other thing is of course that we we are in a learning process this is well some kind of a kind of retro policy but also something extremely new so we don't know as well as for example with the monetary policy that how monetary policy affects what with what kind of lags and so on so we need to have more data, more understanding in how macro tools work. And in that way, one issue is that most of these, at least EU-level harmonized tools, they are focusing on capital, banking capital, while the household-based LTV, DTI type of tools, they are more heterogeneous. So, so that's also one thing that I don't fully understand why we don't have any kind of EU legislations currently on this, that different type of tools. And one thing still in the Finnish case is that because of our current market structure, because of the branchification, I think in our case it would be easier and more effective to be able to use measures which affect more directly the household side instead of the banking capital. Me just, I, I have something, uh, I add something uh, actually concerning this, this toolkits available for non-banks. So the, mm. the ESRB is, is, is pushing uh, so that we can have uh, a toolkit available also for non-banks, uh, what they call the macro potential beyond banking. And I think it's, it's very important, it's a very important step to, to do because otherwise, as it was also shown previously, you can, you can have circumvention by, by uh, non-bank lenders. So you, you end up having something which is not effective, not because you, 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 your diagnosis is wrong or because your action is not the, it's just because you don't have the, the uh, comprehensive enough toolkit to, to deal with the problem. So I think it's, it's what, what the SRB is doing is in this uh, domain is really important. In France, we also expanded a little bit the toolkit beyond banking so that, uh, as it was shown in my table, the, the, the credit standard, the LTV, the STI, DTI, are now available for banks in when, whatever the, the, the lender is, bank insurer or funds. But it's, we still have to do, to do more. And it's, I think it's the, it's the case for, for all of us. Uh, it's, it's really a, a key question so that we ensure that macro potential in the end can be effective. Just a, a quick follow-up before we uh, open it up uh, to more general questions, uh, to questions from the, from, from, from the floor. Uh, on, the, uh, on your last remark uh, about uh, LTV uh, 
being preferable uh, in in a branch situation. So does that or DTI or, or DTI? So does that mean you you could in principle apply those uh, to you know the systemically important branches in your in your country and enforce them on uh, these these branches? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That we can do. And of course, we can also use these, these banking capital related tools. I mean, that there's, of course, there's an agreement that the Swedish finance inspection will kind of use those for the Finnish mortgages. But the process is, uh, is not that straightforward as it probably would be with this other type of tools. But also, I mean, that maybe the. One of the issues is, of course, that when we have made our calculations that when you increase the bank capital, that what it matters, how much it matters for the mortgage interest rates and interest rate spreads. And, of course, one issue is that uh, the direct effect is probably, or at least based on our estimations, the effect is probably quite low. That's another view. I had two quick questions for Gerhard on his talks. The, first, you had the correlation between real estate and the macroeconomy. The, you said they were strongly correlated. Does one lead the other, or are they, just, are they in the same cycle, or does one come before the other? That's, that's my first question. Then he said the, you need to determine monetary policy and macro potential real, real, real estate policy at the same time. Can you elaborate a little bit on that statement? Um, also, the, the, the same questions to, to Kara, because I think it was really fascinating that you redid the work what uh, Claudio Borio and, uh, and other people at the BAS did with really different outcomes. First of all, is it already published? Because I think it is really interesting. And the second thing is looking from an economic side on the connection between GDP and, um, and the housing, then we all think about construction and other things. But I'm wondering whether you have looked at the characteristics why they will be correlated and I have one candidate and that is consumption because in the Netherlands before the crisis we had higher house prices and higher consumption than Germany and after the crisis lower and whether you have, whether you have looked at that issue. A uh, quick question to Banque de France. Uh, uh, during the coffee break, we were sharing experience with a colleague from Ban Banco d'Italia, and uh, there are different perspectives when you uh, enter into force the macroprudential policy measures. So we in Lithuania, we put them in force when they were not really binding, and throughout the years, they became the ceiling to, to the lending and, and so on. So maybe you, what are your views on really putting some non-binding at the current moment uh, macro pro measures, keeping in mind that one day maybe they will become binding and uh, that will become like a level playing field? Perhaps we can, uh, perhaps we can just uh, do those three and then uh, take a few more. Yeah. Okay, I start, yeah. Okay, so um, yeah. Credit, house prices and GDP are quickly, uh, pretty much aligned. Credit tends to lag by half a year. That, that's what we often find on, on, on the cyclical properties. Um, well, that credit lags is most likely just a reflection of the, fa I mean, the fact that it's a stock, no? But, but in general, things are pretty much, pretty much contemporaneous. Um, then, um, on, I'll, I'll leave the question of policies to later. <laughs> it's the most difficult one. Um, yeah, the report is going to be published as, a, as an MP, report of the, of, the, of the Monetary Policy Committee within, within the, 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 the ESCP and then probably as an occasional paper of, of, of the ECP. So that it will be publicly available then uh, in late summer, I guess. 
Uh, we, didn't, we didn't look at, at consumption investment, and indeed we should have done. We just didn't think of that, unfortunately. So in principle, if you, if you think of the, of the connection between housing and, and, and GDP, it, it could just be, well, activity in, 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 in the residential sector, so residential investment. But of course, um, um, well, since uh, households are, are affected by housing finance, they are wealth effect, and the consumption might be affected quite substantially by that. That's actually a long-standing issue in, in macroeconomics now. So indeed, it would be very interesting to look at it. Unfortunately, we thought about that too lately. On, 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 yeah, on the relationship of, of monetary and market potential policies, I mean, there are lots of people working on that, actually, from, from a theoretical perspective. There, there's not so much, much empirical work. One thing that comes to my mind is actually that, that there's some evidence that monetary policy becomes less effective the more resilient the financial sector. There's been some work done at TPS and ECP. You know, the, the better capitalized are banks, the, the less they react to changes in the monetary policy rate and in their credit provision. Um, so there, there's, lots, there's lots of cyclic and structural things to, to be taken into account in that. And I think there's quite some area of work left. Um, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Not, not much more to say on that. Yeah, so on the question of uh, binding versus non-binding measures, so uh, I guess that when you talk about bind, binding in, in this case, it's not about soft measures, but uh, binding measures that are currently not binding, if I understand your question. So uh, the, the, I would see two reasons why not to do that in, in our case. The first one is that, so we followed a general approach, which was risk assessment and policy action, etc. And So the, the, there's a question of communication here. If we think, if we, uh, after the diagnosis, we show that uh, to our point of view, the, the the, the risk is not of a systemic nature, then implementing measures seems uh, can raise a problem of communication. That's the first reason. So, what, so other, in other words, what, why would we conduct stress tests if in the end, whatever the result, we implement measures? So that would be from a communication point of view. But uh, apart from this communication issue, um, there's the question of implementing non-binding measures that would appear as a stance and that would, in, in practice, uh, result in kind of relaxing what is currently the, the, the case. For example, uh, uh, in France, we do not have for residential real estate a hard limit of DSTI. That's not the case. But in practice, banks uh, implement uh, a DSTI of 33%, except in exceptional cases for people, for example, who have very high income. So the vast majority of people are, are uh, bound by this uh, GSTI, which is currently at 33%. So if, for example, we wanted to implement in the law a DSTI, which again is not the case, and I don't know, put it at uh, 35%, then in this case, we would, what would happen in reality is that we, the, the constraints would be relaxed for more, most of the, uh, the, the borrowers, which would be a little bit strange. So this is to say that we, we are cautious about implementing non-binding measures that can appear or could appear as a kind of stance and in the same time uh, result in relaxing what is currently the, the, the case. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so my probably two questions. The first one is about DTI versus DSTI. So in France, you have DSTI. May I ask why? And also, you mentioned the case of Singapore, and they went with DSTI. Maybe you have some more information why they have chosen DSTI rather than DTI. And for you as well, since you are still planning or you wishing, you wish wishing. to have something at least. What what is your preferred choice, DSTI or DTI? From my point of view, you could say that DTI is more a solvency indicator, whereas DSTI is sort of a liquidity angle, is more mm -hmm. captured. But nevertheless, they're both linked through a mathematical formula. DSTI plus maturity of a loan and interest rate, you have DTI, in fact, you can get a certain number. Mm -hmm. So DSTI without an interest rate test is more procyclical in a way, but there are, so going into details, but just I was interested in your preferences. And the second question is, uh, 
actually also both to Yiri and to Tarek. Uh, have you considered when transposing mortgage credit directive uh, by using it as a way to apply uh, borrower-based measures to non-banks, non-bank mortgage lenders, because this is this is opens a venue for activity-based regulation. Anybody who is engaged in mortgage lending, according to that mortgage credit directive, could be subject to those microprudential requirements. So in this way, level playing field would be ensured because, according to that, everybody who is in, involved in mortgage lending activity has to, re, be re, has to register somehow and follow the same standards as banks because now it's all focused on banks, but by using that directive, uh, most countries have transposed it, but there wasn't a window of opportunity actually to use that as a way to capture non-bank mortgage lending activity. Thank you. Do I have to press a button? No, it works. Huh? Okay, I, I have a question to, to all of you because I think uh, what I'm saying is uh, probably a universal challenge. With macroprudential policy, one difficulty is you are trying to act in a counter-cyclical way, okay? So you should act before it's too late, okay? And you have the difficulties when you come uh, early, uh, people tell you, uh, but there is no danger, and then you have the other, the other risk, okay? You wait until the danger is uh, visible for everybody, and probably you do too late, and perhaps even too much, okay? And, uh, and then you, you come with uh, regulatory measures when probably the, the imbalances would perhaps even undo themselves. So how do you deal with, uh, with this challenge, especially, especially because there is also something like a lobbying game. I mean, on the other side, you have the banks, you have probably the construction industry, you have the homeowners, you have tenants that, uh, until they really see a, a real danger, probably they will be against any uh, macro potential measure. Okay, so thanks for the question. So, first of all, up, oh, sorry, if they still want. No problem. I, I have three questions, but I will only have uh, one now. <laughs> for, for Gerhard, so did you consider you uh, looking at um, regional house prices? Because as we s have seen in several presentations, these, these, these can be very different uh, within countries. Now, I can imagine, for instance, in Germany, that may explain, uh, because it's such a large country, but why, why overall you see a very flat pattern. But, uh, well, if you, if you would uh, do your analysis, but also regional uh, GDP and other data, I can imagine that would also uh, uh, give some interesting results. Thank you. Okay, uh, another try. Uh, so first of all, about our preferences between DTI and DSTI. I must say that the jury is still out there. So I mean, we are currently working on the issue, like thinking thinking and analyzing that which would be the better one. And I mean that there is also the issue that one is that which is theoretically optimal, but also that the practicality is also also like also an, an, an another thing there that uh, I mean that it's easier to or it's that, that 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 the banks can use it in a easy enough way. So I don't yet have answer for for you for that. And then the other question about these countercyclical issues, countercyclical tools, that's a good question because currently in Finland there's a lot of discussion going on. When, when we are like saying that we need to have more tools, we want to have more tools and so on, then, and the others are saying, especially the industry are saying that you don't need those tools because we don't have a problem now. And and the issue is, of course, that it's better to have tools when you have a problem in the future. But also another thing is that, personally, I don't think that macro-pro tools would be like mm, fine-tuning tools, like monetary policy or, or, or automatic stabilizers in the fiscal policy. So somehow I see it a bit more closer to, a bit more to us to structural policy than like at least fine-tuning cyclical policy. 
Yeah, I, I, th I think this real-time issue is by far the most, the, the most complicated and the most difficult one. There's really a paradox on it, that the, the same as, as, as Jan has, has talked about in, in the morning, it basically systemic risk builds up when volatilities are low. And you, you could take the extreme position that, that, you know, you're sure to be in a bubble if everyone believes that finally developments are permanent. I, th I think that's somehow what we have seen, seen before, before 2008. Um, yeah, it, 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 I think I simply think it, it requires lots of it requires lots of discipline, and it, it also requires some sort of, of independence of, of the authorities, not not to get not to get trapped in, in say in a public opinion. But I think I think really um, successful policy would, would require quite quite some discipline and sticking sticking to rules. Yeah. Um, on, on the other question, uh, we, we did not look at regional, regional developments in house prices. We just stick to the national level. But on, on Germany, I think, I think you're right. The, B, the BS has some, some paper on this. Where, where um, on, on Germany, there are three, diff, three um, indicators of house prices. The Bundesbank one just considers uh, house prices in, in rural areas, and that have been, has been increasing, I think, by 30 or 40 percent over recent years. Where, whereas the remainder of the country apparently remained flat. So. Clearly, I mean, um, there's an issue there, yeah. So as regard the question for DTI versus DSTI, so um, in France, so we, we currently do not have neither DTI nor DSTI as a hard measure. Uh, what we have is a market practice of banks regarding DSTI. So I'm not saying that if we one day implement something, we would implement a DSTI rather than a DTI. Uh, there's the question of practicality that was mentioned because they, now the DSTI is something very well known by people, but if one day we had to, to introduce, uh, for example, a DSTI, we would probably combine it with a, the with a limit on maturity, otherwise it's can, mm -hmm. it can be bypassed. So in any case, it, we, we will come back to kind of uh, uh, DTI. Uh, there was a question of acting before it's too late or too... So, yeah, th th this is a question of really fine-tuning, which is relevant for cyclical measures. So when the timing really matters, counter-cyclical buffer, for example. In the case of structural measures, obviously, it's, it's less relevant and less of an issue. But this is, again, there's no uh, miracle uh, answer to this. It's really a question of looking at the early warning indicators that we have trying not to, <laughs> uh, not to, um, to get the right, the right timing, but it's not, not only uh, um, a question of models of, of, or early warning indicators or whatever, it's also a question of expert judgment. That's, that's by the way, was, was one of the, uh, the conclusions of this CGFS report that I mentioned. It was that there was still room for expert judgment in macro prudential policy. We're not yet at a stage where we can just apply models, push, uh, uh, buttons and, and get the right answer. That's uh, clearly not the case. Um, there was another question by you. I, uh, um, we can talk about it. By So, well, in the in the case of France, that's uh, by national law already the case. So, all non-bank lenders or significant non-bank lenders, and by the way, at this stage, it's rather a, a, a very tiny part of the market. But anyway, it's already the case that we can impose LTV, DSTI, DTI on non-bank lenders in the Fr in the French legislation. I think there was also a question on regional differentiation in the context of France. I think that's. Uh, uh, a you, relevant question. You mean for for measures or for so well then then the, there's uh, <laughs> the issue of uh, regional or, or very local is as I guess the case in many many countries um, for residential real estate obviously but also as we saw for commercial real estate there's a lot of heterogeneity between my, uh, I mean it's sometimes it has absolutely no uh, nothing in common in terms of level about real estate prices in Paris and in some 
districts of Paris and with other cities or with other countries. It's has nothing in common. The only thing that it has that, that, that it can share is sometimes the dynamics. So sometimes the dynamics look alike, but uh, the, the, le the levels are totally different. As uh, the, in the graph, I showed that there was uh, a ratio of one to six uh, between some districts in Paris and districts in, in, other, in other cities. As regards the measures now, that would be a little bit more difficult because applying local measures that would probably raise some uh, legal issue if we want to do this in France so the, that we want to target for example this uh, uh, city and not the other one etc so it would raise probably a lot of uh, issues I'm not, a, I'm not a legal expert not at all but I would guess that would, that would be uh, difficult in, in practice to do it I, I know that some countries I think uh, that we sh uh, saw the case in Denmark do it and Maybe even South Korea do something like this, but I'm not sure that in France we could do it. Um, but again, I'm not a legal expert, so maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Um, if, it, if, if this is a, a two-hander, we can, we can take one more, one more question. Uh, but I think the time otherwise is... Yes, <clears throat> my name is Sigurdur and I come from the Supervisory Authority in Iceland. Uh, in our uh, legislation on markets uh, uh, credit, um, we have a, a special rule for first-time buyers. Um, it is difficult, can be difficult to define what is uh, first time, for example, if it's a secondary home. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, do you have, do you know of any other countries applying such a rule or and uh, have you any opinion on on the effect of such a such a provision thank you so at least i can say that in our ltc case it is so that the current general level is 90 percent but for first time house buyers is 95 but as mentioned, we have been applying this policy since last July, so don't, can't say anything too, too strong about of these two quarter data what we have there. Just, just, just to add, I think there are a, a, a few countries that make that uh, differentiation. I think Ireland is, is one of them. Uh, they have something uh, special for, for first-time buyers, and I think Mm -hmm. The same is true in, in, in Singapore and in Israel. Uh, but we can talk about this uh, perhaps uh, later on. But I think our, our time really is up, and uh, it's time to close uh, the session. Perhaps give him a hand. <laughs> yeah.